Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Now I Have a Rival, The Two Amy Garveys. One of the many covers that Norman Rockwell did for the Saturday Evening Post shows a sailor getting a new tattoo. He's got the names of six women written on his upper arm, each of them crossed out, and the tattoo artist is at work adding a seventh. A couple of decades before this image was created, Marcus Garvey had already showed the way to avoid such difficulties. After marrying and quickly separating from his wife, Amy, he married his second wife, also named Amy. Say what you will about Garvey, as his critics certainly did, but he knew what he liked. Both of his wives, Amy Ashwood Garvey and Amy Jakes Garvey, were from Jamaica, and both were fiercely intelligent women who threw themselves into his UNIA movement and the cause of Pan-Africanism. They were also friends, who may have known each other already in Jamaica before coming to the States. Amy Jakes, already hired on as a secretary by the UNIA, even participated in the first wedding as a bridesmaid. The situation was summed up by Tony Martin in his book about Garvey's first wife as follows. Here, Marcus was confronted with a question of two Amys, both Jamaican, each the other's best friend, both beautiful and talented, one the bride of his marriage, the other chief bridesmaid, one his wife, the other his private secretary, and as a veteran Garveyite was careful to point out, both Capricorns. Actually, it might be more accurate to say that Marcus Garvey thought he knew what he liked. Though he chose to marry two independent and brilliant women, he seems to have expected that they would mostly stay at home, making a family, rather than fulfilling their potential as fellow leaders of the UNIA. The fact that he and Amy Jakes stayed together, as he and Amy Ashwood did not, may have in part been due to the fact that she was willing to tolerate this. One scholar has written that Amy Jakes chose to invest her strength and talents in her husband's career. She defined her role as Garvey's comforter and surrogate, whereas Amy Ashwood had viewed herself more as an equal. Yet there's a story involving Amy Jakes in which she gave a speech introducing her husband that threatened to steal the show. When he took the stage after this barnstorming performance, Marcus Riley said, Now I have a rival, but I am glad she is my wife. The real rivals, though, were the two women. Amy Ashwood blamed Amy Jakes for the quick breakdown of their marriage and claimed that she and Marcus were never really divorced. Battles in court were only part of the long-running hostility between them. In the 1920s, when Marcus said that Amy Ashwood was only using the name Garvey, Ashwood remarked, this fight between us is going to last for some time. And she was right. Since both women claimed to be the proper custodian of his legacy, the rivalry was destined to continue for decades, well after Marcus's death in 1940. They shared many political and philosophical views, but they could not share the title of Amy Garvey. One unfortunate consequence of their conflict is that numerous details of their relationships with one another and with Marcus are disputed. Amy Jakes, for instance, denied having known Amy Ashwood back in Jamaica. More generally, Amy Ashwood made a lot of claims about her own life that were rejected by Marcus and his second wife. Ashwood's version of events would offer better material for the film that is crying out to be made with these characters. She describes a cinema-ready meet-cute in which she encountered Garvey at a bus stop, who had just heard her give a thrilling speech. Garvey approached her, saying, I have found my star of destiny. I have found my Josephine. Even better, during their liaison, she supposedly threw herself between Marcus and a would-be assassin, literally ready to take a bullet for her, Napoleon. But Marcus recounted different versions of both events, which is typical of the he said, she said, she said stories about this lover's triangle. Even Amy Ashwood's date of birth in Jamaica is uncertain, with different evidence pointing to various dates between 1895 and 1898. She described the formative experience of being told how her Ashanti great-grandmother was abducted from Africa in 1834 and brought to Jamaica. Upon hearing this story, Ashwood said, I suddenly knew the meaning of race and felt the power of blood. From this time onwards, I nursed a passion in my heart for Africa. A powerful feeling of connection to Africa would indeed sustain her throughout her life. 
Traveling in West Africa in 1947, she even took an Ashanti name and started wearing African dress. It was an unusual choice for a diasporic figure, in honor of which she would later be called Mother of the Dashiki. Traveling was something Ashwood did a lot. Her career took her from the Caribbean to the United States, Africa, and England, where she founded a restaurant and club, both of which became magnets for the Africana intelligentsia. The club, called the Florence Mills Social Parlor, was said in a 1936 newspaper article to be the headquarters for Negroes in the English metropolis, and elsewhere a place where intellectuals from all parts of the world were wont to gather. Indeed, Ashwood's social circle included George Padmore, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, J.B. Danka, and C.L.R. James, who said that her international Afro restaurant was very important to me because from those early days to this day, I find English food uneatable. James rightly praised Ashwood as a militant anti-imperialist in recognition of her sustained activism and critique of European policies towards Africa. She helped found an organization in support of Nigerian independence and appeared at the 5th Pan-African Congress, to the chagrin of Amy Jakes, who was invited to be a co-convener of the event by W.E.B. Du Bois, but could not travel to the Congress because of financial constraints. As a disciple of Garveyism, Ashwood always emphasized the importance of racial solidarity, and was critical when she found it lacking. Thus, after a trip to Trinidad, she sourly remarked, I find Negroes here practically, if not entirely, devoid of race consciousness. It is hard to think that a people could so completely lose their identity in a few hundred years. With time, though, she increasingly distanced herself from strict adherence to her husband's teachings. Already in 1924, she had warned against insisting on immediate independence for African nations, stating, My view is that the Negro as a race is not yet ripe for political emancipation. She was downright dismissive of Marcus's dream of a single African state, citing something we have ourselves often had cause to emphasize, the diversity of African peoples. Mr. Garvey's idea of an African kingdom was a geographic blunder. There are too many tribes, each differing from the other in customs, so that it is quite impossible to form them into a single people. She ultimately abandoned the Garveyite stress on pure racial identity, writing around 1960 that future developments in the New World generally may show Garvey having been too dogmatic about racial matters in the Americas. The New World is the great melting pot of nations and races, and eventually even black and white will be merged. A new people, compounded of the various racial elements from the old world, will then emerge. But her commitment to activism never flagged. Around the same time, she was founding the Association for the Advancement of Colored People, a British version of the NAACP. Perhaps the most obvious contrast between Ashwood's thought and that of her erstwhile husband is her feminism. The UNIA did allow women to occupy leadership positions. Many branches had a lady president in charge of organizing local women to support the movement. But ultimately, as one scholar has said, Garveyism was also based on patriarchal models of nationhood, in which the message of race first was coded language for men first. Garvey's expectations of his own wives matched his ideas about family more generally, with women homemakers offering comfort and moral support to confident, active husbands and raising the next generation of race-conscious boys. Thus, one Garveyite remarked, You find any woman, especially a black woman, who does not want to be a mother, you may rest assured she is not a true woman. This looks like standard early 20th century sexism, but things may be more complicated. It's been argued that this aspect of Garveyism was actually a response to the racist expectation that white women should stay home as happy homemakers, while black women should do badly paid menial labor. In this context, it was seen as a form of liberation that black women should be confined to the domestic sphere like their white counterparts. This strategy of the UNIA broke down during the Great Depression, though. With black men out of work or unable to make ends meet, black women had to seek jobs outside the home. As for Ashwood, her own activism went well beyond the typical role of female UNIA members, and throughout her life, she spoke out about the conditions endured by women of her race. During her tours of Africa, as she said, she was interested mainly in the problems and affairs of my sex. She made detailed observations about marriage practices, and also noted that in at least some African cultures, including the Ashanti, 
women wielded considerable political power. This makes Ashwood a forerunner of the scholars we drew on in a previous episode, who in more recent decades have explored the role of women in traditional African cultures. She was proud of her work in Africa as both ethnographer and political agitator. This point is made nicely in one of her many barbed comments about Marcus, whom she used as a source of public authority even as she accused him of private betrayal. Upon arriving in Liberia, something her husband never managed to do, she said, Some got the parades, but I the promised land. Amy Jakes rarely, if ever, adopted such a satirical tone about her husband. Yet her feelings about him and their marriage were decidedly mixed. Looking back on her time with him, she said that the value of a wife to him was like a gold coin, expendable to get what he wanted and hard enough to withstand rough usage in the process. Their time together was beset by financial difficulties and Garvey's stint in prison. His incarceration gave her a degree of independence so that this period was a high point for Jakes's role in the movement. Still, she was not given an official leadership role in the UNIA, something condescendingly justified by the desire to defend this helpless woman from the many critics of Garveyism. To which Jakes retorted, With my unusual general knowledge and experience for a young woman, may I not ask if the word helpless is not misapplied? Indeed, she was at this point already a well-rounded activist and thinker, primed to step up into the role of surrogate leader. In the gender terms of the day, she was capable of doing the work of a man. These were terms she sometimes challenged, as when she said, I don't think or act as if I were just a woman. On other occasions, she was willing to at least play along with the expectations of her husband and other men. This is well illustrated by a piece in a 1923 issue of the Negro World, the UNIA newspaper. Entitled, Ten Minutes with Mrs. Marcus Garvey, it begins unpromisingly as the reporter boasts of his skill at interviewing the ladies. I have always prided myself on knowing something about their pet subjects, theaters, music, cosmetics, and dress. He's then confronted with Jakes, who discourses on the irrelevance of physical beauty, which can be lost, whereas the higher self rises supreme above the material obstacles and is truly permanently beautiful. Here was a new kind of reasoning, declares the astonished reporter, and from such a little woman, too. But when she is asked what is uppermost in her thoughts, Jake says that it is her husband. His work is his whole existence. Take away his work and you take away his life. Knowing this, I endeavored to be conversant with subjects that would help in his career and try to make home a haven of rest and comfort. Appropriately enough, that page of the Negro world also features a picture of a hotel named after Phyllis Wheatley, the revolutionary era poet who was perhaps the very first figure to confront the tyranny of low expectations for black female thinkers in America. The same newspaper would soon give Jakes a forum for expressing her views on that subject and many other topics as she edited the regularly appearing page called Our Women and What They Think. In this capacity, she wrote nearly 200 editorials, which make for especially fascinating reading when you look at them in their original context. To take a random example, a page from April 19, 1924, includes advertisements for dresses, hair grower, Negro dolls, and face beautifier, an article decrying colonialism in the Caribbean, a quote from Marcus Garvey, a race without authority and power is a race without respect, tips for housewives, a poem, a scriptural quotation, and an invitation to women of Negro race to let the world know what you are thinking and doing by writing personally to Jake's. The wording of that invitation was carefully chosen. It echoed her description of the purpose of this feature of the Negro world, namely to prove that Negro women are great thinkers as well as doers. In theory, Jake's was just a particularly prominent laborer in the cause of Garveyism. She said herself, I only live to perpetuate the ideas of my husband, just as thousands of other Negroes, imbued with his spirit, have vowed to do. But in practice, she used her editorial role for a mission of her own. Usually, she wrote, a woman's page is any journal devoted solely to dress, home hints, and love topics, but our page is unique in that it seeks to give out the thoughts of our women on all subjects affecting them in particular, and others in general. This pleases the modern Negro woman, who believes that God Almighty has not limited her intellect because of her sex. Next to this, we find a recipe for scalloped mushrooms. 
Among those who were impressed by Jakes's journalistic work was a man who was in a good position to judge, the longtime editor T. Thomas Fortune, who said of Jakes's work that she was born with genius to do it. Jakes was an editor of Marcus's speeches and writings, too, and made adjustments to his wording, as when she softened the prediction that black men shall put up a fight that shall write a page upon the history of human affairs by specifying that the fight would be a constitutional one. But it's her own ideas that come out in the editorials. For instance, her argument for the proposition that women should participate in politics. They should not neglect their homes to do so, but as rational and reasonable beings, they can be relied upon to decide how to split their efforts between the public and private spheres. The notion that women should be housebound is antiquated because women have been endowed with the same mental faculties as men. In addition to these are their natural gifts of graciousness and keenness of mind. As that last quote implies, Jakes is convinced that women have something special to bring to politics, something that is urgently needed. She thinks that the laws they introduce will be humane legislations that only the detailed and fine minds of the female sex can conceive. Such legislations uplift the homes, communities, and nation. Therefore, the home has not been neglected, but benefited. That inference is crucial for her because she never goes so far as to challenge the idea that the domestic sphere is the specific concern of the married woman. In one telling juxtaposition, she writes a piece on behalf of her jailed husband, suggesting, that's the price he paid because he dared to teach us to say, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. And just below that includes a short essay called Woman as Man's Helper. It asks, what great man has ever done any profitable thing without the help of some good woman? And praises the women of the UNIA for their steadfast patience. It's a fair guess that Jakes very much has herself in mind here, among others, as the long-suffering and unfailingly supportive partner of a man who has been imprisoned for his political views. In her own life, Jakes found it difficult to balance her two roles, raising Marcus's children while he left Jamaica for England, and trying to contribute to the cause in her own right. It was a tension at the heart of her brand of feminism, which, as one scholar has written, involved a vision of motherhood that entailed community activism as well as private domesticity. This makes for a contrast with Amy Ashwood, who used the freedom of her childless situation to tour the world giving speeches and founding organizations. When Ashwood spoke at the Pan-African Congress, she complained that very much has been written and spoken of the Negro, but for some reason very little has been said about the Black woman, who has been shunted into the social background to be a childbearer. Amy Jakes would probably have agreed with that, but in her editorials, she rarely let slip her persona as dutiful but politically engaged wife and mother. This is consistent with her habit of chastising black men for their lazy failure to support both their families and the struggle. With a flash of wit, she writes, We hope some of our male readers will, in defense of their sex, supply us with a plausible excuse, that is, if they can summon enough energy to do so. This gives her another reason to espouse political participation of women. They can hardly do worse than men have done. You had your day at the helm of the world, she tells the males, and a pretty mess you've made of it. Perhaps women's rule will usher in the era of real brotherhood, when national and racial lines will disappear, leaving mankind in peace and harmony one with another. None of this sounds particularly Garveyite, but the feminist themes aired on the women's page sit alongside more typical UNIA discussion points. She often alludes to world affairs, especially to the condition of women in places like China and the young Soviet Union, where, she says, the Reds have sense enough to realize that if the mothers of men are not treated fairly, men are but limiting their own progress and development. Many of her pieces attack colonialism, and here she tends to agree with Amy Ashwood that a gradual withdrawal of the European powers from Africa would be best. They'd better not wait too long, though, because white folk are massively outnumbered on the African continent, and it is only a matter of time until black Africans sweep all obstacles away and enjoy the benefits of freedom, dearly bought but highly prized. Towards that end, Jakes would later propose an African Freedom Charter, which she envisioned as applicable to Africans in Africa, abroad, and all peoples of African descent, whether 100% or 1%. That's a nice example of the way that, like Garvey himself, she sought to draw together the interests of diasporic and indigenous Africans. 
In this respect, Jakes adhered more closely to the views of her husband than her rival Ashwood was willing to do. In 1948, she continued to urge diasporic black people to see themselves as units of a mighty whole whose center is Africa, since the ties of blood that bind us transcend all national boundaries. Indeed, Jakes claimed to speak not just for Garvey, but with him. After his death, he would appear to her in her dreams, guiding her work and her thought from beyond the grave. Given Amy Ashwood's agonized relationship with Marcus, she could not so easily claim to be carrying on where he had left off. Yet when, as an old woman, she was asked what she thought of the political movements of the 1960s, she allowed that the Black Power movement seemed to be the fruition of Garvey's program. As for Martin Luther King Jr., she didn't care so much for him, because, she said, I am a Garveyite. As these quotations from Ashwood show, Garveyism was no passing phase. It lastingly shaped ideas about the African diaspora throughout the 20th century. So, before we move on to our next major topic, the Harlem Renaissance, we'll be devoting one more episode to Garveyism and Black nationalism. For this, we've found an ideal match whose expertise on the subject is unrivaled, Michael Dawson, who has written extensively on nationalism and its relationship to other ideologies in Black thought, like liberalism and radicalism. So join us next week to hear all about our guests and what he thinks, next time here on The History of Africana Philosophy.